have a lot uh, to discuss today. So we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started. And um, I was asked at the end of the last class to introduce myself a little. Um, I didn't think about the, the need for that. but. Um, so again, my name is uh, Amy Steele, Dr. Amy Steele. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Life at Vanderbilt Divinity. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how I came to Thurman Studies. How about that? OK. So um, I moved here 20 years ago. It's, you know, saying that is hard to believe. It's been that long. <laughs> it's 20 years. And I moved here to attend Vanderbilt Divinity School. And, um, and I'm going to say that I came to Thurman Studies. Good morning. Came to Thurman Studies through um, both my professional work as a Master of Divinity student um, and as a, a graduate student in the Graduate Department of Religion. So um, as a Master of Divinity student, I took a course from Dr. Forrest Harris, and the course was Black Religious Leadership. We studied a number of um, Black religious leaders, and we were asked at some point in the um, course, in, in, the, in the, the sort of the timeline of that course, to choose a figure uh, for which we would then do a uh, written essay uh, as well as an oral presentation. And, um, and I wanted to consult with the professor. And I thought, well, if the professor has, and this is recorded, there's a YouTube of me saying this. I can't even believe, you know, we're recording this again. Anyway. Um, and I thought that I would consult with the professor, Dr. Harris. And I asked Dr. Harris because I had someone in mind. When I went to him after class to ask who he thought I should choose, it was not the person that I had in mind. <laughs> and so. Um, he immediately said Howard Thurman, and at that point, this was, like I said, this was almost 20 years ago, I hadn't heard of Howard Thurman. And I thought, well, who is that? And I went to the library, and I found this book. And I'm going to use the microphone today because I'm, you know, I'm fighting that cred that everybody has. I um, found this book, his autobiography with head and heart. And I'm, I'm not kidding you, by the, maybe by the, what page is this? This is the first chapter, but 29 pages in, I didn't even realize I was reading. It was that compelling. And I thought, well, he was right. <laughs> Good professor. All right. So I was glad I chose him, and, or glad that he recommended Howard Thurman, and glad that I ultimately chose him. And then in um, graduate school, um, my, my mentor, dissertation advisor, et cetera, et cetera, the person that I worked with primarily, Victor Anderson, kept asking me to guest lecture on Howard Thurman. And I thought, what is this? <laughs> you know, why um, am, do I keep coming back to this person's figure, religious figure? And um, I guess the more that I studied him and the more that I prepared for these lectures and the more that I thought about what Thurman was doing, um, I was beginning to want to think even more deeply about Thurman, and then um, that interest grew into a dissertation proposal that I defended, and then that gave me the okay to write the dissertation. So there's a whole dissertation out there on Howard Thurman. The title of my dissertation is um, The Mystical Aesthetic, um, Howard Thurman and the Art of Meaning. Meaning. Uh, so it is, I really had a good time writing it after a point. <laughs> after a point, I'll be honest, after a point. Um, and so really what you, you know, whenever I talk about Thurman, it, it sort of the, the residue, the residual of my, of my work, right? Of my, um, all these years thinking about him. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm from, if anyone cares to know that, um, little town east of here, Oak Ridge. I don't know if you've heard of Oak Ridge. Um, but yeah, I was trained at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga uh, for undergraduate work, and then Vanderbilt Divinity School, and then Vanderbilt Graduate School of Religion. So that's, that's me, okay? All right, so I um, don't have fancy technology today. 
it slowed us down a little bit last week. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go back to the old-fashioned handout. Um, and so I'm going to give you a, a few things today. Um, today we are, we are going to focus on the genre of the sermon and the discipline of preaching, okay? And, um, and how both are related specifically to Thurman. But before we do, I'm going to give you a copy of the timeline, which I should have given you last week. I walked out of my office without it. I didn't want to tell you that. Um, but you have it. You have it this week. And then I've also emailed it to, to Shonda, Chandra. And so um, you will have it in the, on the course website. Okay? I'm giving you two things. I'm giving you, please take both. Um, Actually, they're collated, which means that um, it's not two, two separate stacks, okay? Um, but you'll need two sheets of paper. Um, the timeline is a front and back, thank you. And then um, attached to that or with that is a um, sort of a, I'm calling it a bibliographic sketch of his works. So you have a little bit of a bibliography of Thurman, but with some narrative around that. Um, so when everybody gets a timeline, we're going to walk through that again just quickly. And, um, and then I'm going to read to you a little bit. <clears throat> and then we're, gonna, we're going to uh, uh, talk about the sermon. And, and I want to start with the sermon because, of course, our class title, yeah, it's two together. Our class title is Deep River Mysticism and Ethics and the Preaching of Howard Thurman. So I thought... You know, let's start with the building blocks, and um, we are going to talk a little bit first about the sermon, so we, you know, so that we're all on the same page, or on a similar page, around uh, this particular kind of oratory, and um, and then we'll go from there. Uh, next week we'll jump into mysticism, the week after ethics, and then we'll try and bring all these together. Okay, um, the timeline. You've heard all this. I went through it without the dates last week. Um, the timeline should give you a clearer picture, right, of who Dr. Thurman was, um, sort of what part of the country he hails from, um, what parts of the country um, influenced him in his life, where, you know, sort of where he went and what he was doing. So we'll just run through it. Um, 1899, we said this last week, Howard Thurman was born. Um, I, I have since read some um, data that says that he was m more likely born um, in West Palm Beach, Florida, but he grew up in Daytona, okay? Um, just to give you some clarity around that. He has two siblings. Henrietta is the older sister, and Madeline is his younger. The family church is Mount Bethel um, Baptist Church. His um, father, and there's a whole story about this in, in the autobiography, and I'll keep referring to that a bit. I'm going to read from it a bit. Excuse me with head and heart, but Saul, um, Saul Solomon Thurman, his father, dies <clears throat> in 1907. Um, in 1912, Thurman's baptized in the Halifax River. You know, um, that's significant. Um, when you read the autobiography, what well, becomes immediately evident, and this is what drew me in, to be honest with you, what becomes immediately evident is Thurman's um, affinity and um, attraction to nature, right? He, um, and he writes beautifully about um, the nightfall being his companion, he writes about this oak tree that um, grew just behind his house um, where he would go and pray. So, you know, the, the Halifax River, I mean, I specify that for a reason, but he's baptized there. We'll move on. Um, 1915, he leaves uh, Daytona Beach for Florida, for the F Florida Baptist Academy in Jacksonville, Florida to complete high school. There was no um, high school for, for black folks in Daytona. So he had to go to Jacksonville. He completes his high school education there, um, graduates with honors. Um, senior year 1919 of high school, he meets Mordecai Johnson. 
Um, Mordecai Johnson is a significant figure again. You know, all the, I can't stop for everything, every little thing, but Mordecai Johnson will play a significant role in Thurman's life, um, mentoring him um, as a high school student, as a college student. It, um, Mordecai Johnson is the president, white man, president of Howard University in D.C. Um, that's significant, and, and hopefully, you know, some of that's going to come out. Um, but he meets him for the first time um, at a YWCA, YMCA retreat on Kings Mountain. And again, it's Mordecai Johnson who's credited with advising him to actually go on to college and, 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 and do graduate work. 1920, he, he enrolls at Morehouse College. He meets the young professors Benjamin Mays and E. Franklin Frazier. 1922, he takes summer courses in philosophy at Columbia in New York. Um, in 1923, he actually graduates from Morehouse with a degree in economics. Again, he graduates with honors. Um, 1923, he goes, moves to New York to go to Rochester Theological Seminary. There he meets professors uh, George Cross, who is professor of systematic theology, and Henry Robbins. Um, in 1925, he's introduced to the writings of Olive Schreiner at a retreat in New York, 1926 through 1929. He graduates from Rochester Theological Seminary. He gets married to Kate Kelly. Kate Kelly is a beautiful human. Um, she's a social worker. Um, her family is sort of a Morehouse Bellman family. And um, there are accounts that they may have met one another bef before. Um, not sure about that. But um, so they get married. They move to Oberlin, Ohio. Um, he's invited to pastor there, the Mount Zion Baptist Church. Um, and here he discovers that he appreciates the creative method, that's in quotes, creative method of the sermon series, which basically means he, you know, he um, enjoys preaching like, you know, a three-week sermon series on a topic. Um, but he discovers it there. He enrolls in postgraduate studies at Oberlin School of Theology, where he takes courses in Old and New Testament studies. He and Kate uh, birth their first daughter, Olive Catherine. And um, Kate actually gets ill. Um, Kate is a social worker. She's, she's not a social worker initially. She's a, you know, she um, is a third grade teacher, I think, for a year. And then she herself, before they marry, this is all before they marry, she's a social work, um, a, a third grade teacher for a year. She actually enrolls um, at uh, Chicago Divinity School, or the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Doesn't stay there returns to Atlanta to work um, in or for the uh, the Anti-Tuberculosis Association of Atlanta. The, the, um, and so it's there where it's believed that she contracted tuberculosis. And so she gets very, very sick. Um, and um, they leave um, when, when sort of in the course of that period, um, Howard Thurman leaves to go and study with Ruf Rufus Jones, uh, the Quaker mystic, and Kate, because she's so sick, returns back home to LaGrange, Georgia, she and the baby, and she stays there to, you know, they hope get, get, get well. Um, as you can see that, you know, she eventually, um, she eventually dies from, from, from TB. Um, but this special um, semester that Howard Thurman studies with this mystic Rufus Jones is a semester where he's taking all of Rufus Jones' philosophy classes and uh, to my friend here, takes a seminar on Miser S. Uh, Eckhart. And so, you know, there's a, f there, again, there, there um, is a formal um, class where he, so you know, and then you wonder about all of the influences and hopefully um, I said or indicated or pointed towards last week that there, um, there was an influence here from, from Miser Eckhart and from his, from his works. In 1929, 1931, he gets a teaching job at Morehouse um, and he teaches philosophy and religion. So actually a joint um, appointment, um, Morehouse and Spellman, they're you know, Morehouse is the college for men, right? And Spelman is the college for, for women, black women. 
Um, he teaches philosophy and religion at Morehouse, and he later becomes the dean of the chapel. And at Spelman, he teaches Bible as living literature and um, is asked to be the religious advisor to faculty and students. And um, they give birth to their first child. Um, so I got ahead of myself there. But, but during this period of time, um, they give birth. Um, and then Kate Kelly dies. After Kate Kelly dies, Howard Thurman, and I'm not real sure about the time um, on this trip, but it says that he goes to Europe basically to mourn and to reground himself um, to London, Paris, and, and Geneva, and then he comes back. In 1932, he marries someone that he has again met, we think, previously, Sue Bailey Thurman. And Sue Bailey is the person that we're, we're more familiar with, right? Um, Sue Bailey Thurman was a traveling collegiate secretary of the YWCA in, um, and uh, just before they are married or, you know, I mean, it's like days, um, they, they get married and then he takes a teaching position and the position of, of a dean of the chapel at Howard Divinity School, okay? Um, he is compelled by the idea um, of, again, Mordecai um, Johnson, you know, this idea of the training of black um, men and women and the assembling of the, you know, of a, of a faculty, a star faculty to do that. And so he takes uh, this position and while he's there, um, the Thurmans are asked to be members of a year-long delegation to India, Ceylon, and, and Burma, which they, he refers to, and I think they refer to as the Pilgrimage of Friendship. Um, 1932 to 1944, he's at Howard, and his second daughter is born. I wanted to read, um, actually I skipped over a couple of things, but let me read from um, a couple of things, pages 92 in the book. Um, This is significant, you know, this, this excerpt here is, is significant because, um, again, against the backdrop of our theme, right, um, mysticism and ethics and preaching, you see seeds of um, Thurman's ultimate experiment in San Francisco, here at Howard, particularly. Um, you, see it in, you see it at Morehouse, too, but let me read from the, autobi the autobiography again with Head and Heart, this is page 92. Um, it says this, at Howard, I began to experiment with forms of worship other than usual religious services. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. The sermon was not always the centerpiece. Within the regular order of service, I provided stretches of time for meditation, a quiet time for prayers generated by silence. I also wanted to develop a service that would permit greater freedom for the play of creative imagination, a vesper service. These were called twilight hours. Each twilight hour was different in form and texture. I knew there was a felt need in the congregation with its diversity of religious background for a sense of the majesty of holy writ. The very first service was devoted to the ancient heritage of man's quest for God. That was the title, the ancient heritage of man's quest for God. Using both Old and New Testament passages that address this theme, some dramatically, some even rebelliously, and others, as in the great Psalms, with a sublime sense of redemption. These selections were typed and mimeographed as a single connected story. As shadows gathered in Rankin Chapel after an organ prelude, I began to read aloud, the tones of the organ weaving in and out in muted, muted accompaniment. There were periods of silence here and there to allow the inspiration of the words to hold full sway. When the service was over, I left the pulpit, but the audience remained in their seats in total silence for several minutes. When they rose to leave, the ushers gave each of them a copy of the reading. One of the most daring of these twilight hours was the introduction of dance as a spiritual ritual. This was a hazardous experiment <laughs> because the general attitude toward dance was that it might be art, but it was also entertainment. 
The physical education department had long taught creative dancing for women, but no one related this to worship. Sue shared my interest in the use of the arts in the twilight hours and introduced me to a young dancer who taught in a Catholic institution in Baltimore. She was attempting to use dance as an act of Christian worship and was greatly enthusiastic when I invited her to give a solo dance vesper in Rankin Chapel at Howard. I selected four of the universal moods of the human spirit. Praise, thanksgiving, contrition, and faith. Readings were selected to accompany each dance. Several taken from the Bible and selections of music were chosen by the dancer to be played by the university organist. Every effort was made to prepare the community for the Vesper. These were carefully designed announcements. There were carefully designed announcements with comments in the Sunday Bulletin. We never missed an opportunity to discuss the event during our daily rounds on the campus. At last, the Sunday arrived. The chapel was packed for the service. Even the standing room area in the rear. I could sense the mixture of confused anticipation, skepticism, honest curiosity, and for many, eagerness to find yet another way to reach the highest altar. Dressed in flowing robes, the dancer entered, and the moment was hers. Like the instant just before the first finger of dawn moves above the horizon at the break of day. Would the sun appear, or would it be hidden by morning mist and cloud? Suddenly, it was if the walls separating each of us from the other was removed and we became a worshipful people united by a single rhythmic, rhythmic beat. It was magnificent. Here was a young Caucasian woman, Roman Catholic by religious faith, sharing an experience of profoundest spiritual significance with a group made up of predominantly black Protestant worshipers in a university religious service. What happened was its own authenticity. I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit more. An even more dramatic expression of the twilight hours was, was one that in time became a, tr a chapel tradition at Christmas. This was the staged presentation of the living Madonnas, posed to replicate great paintings. I selected six European masterpieces that seemed appropriate for this presentation and sent for reproductions. The idea was to render in tableau a life-size reproduction of each masterpiece, get, piece, giving careful attention to composition, color, and costume. I discussed my choices with the fine arts faculty and the director of the University Art Gallery. At first, the idea seemed to be a staggering undertaking, impractical for a chapel stage, but I was convinced that if we could recreate these pictures with living subjects, living subjects, perfectly lighted at intervals of several minutes, the congregation could experience the breathtaking beauty and spiritual depth of the famous originals. To enhance the visual experience, it occurred to me that an Ave Maria by one of the great composers could be played or sung. This was the School of Music's special contribution. Under the auspices of the Department of Drama and Home Economics in the College of Liberal Arts, a large picture frame, nine by five feet, was built, stretched with theatrical gauze, and placed in the center of the chapel platform. Lights were arranged on all sides of the frame and velvet curtains hung from the side walls. It was considered a great honor to be chosen as a Madonna. I always got a warm reception whenever I visited the women's quadrangle of dormitories, but my popularity increased by leaps and bounds just before selection time. <laughs> I had an advantage over the original artists. The colors of my models were alive and various and ranged from ivory to burnt umber. They were more beautiful than any painting. The night of the performance, 
as the lights were brought up slowly to f full illumination of the tableau and the music of the Ave Marias filled the chapel, the effect was electri electrifying. In the interval between each reproduction, there was utter silence. It was what Otto calls the numinous silence of waiting. The congregation and the participants were fused in a single moment of spiritual transcendence. I discovered again through worship that an experience of unity among peoples can be more compelling than all that separates and divides. This type of Vesper was later recreated at several colleges throughout the country, and I'll stop there. So you get a sense, right? You're be so you begin to get a sense of um, this play, particularly in this case, excuse me, of uh, the mystical, right? The mystical. Um, and that's a, a really great example there. And there are others, particularly if you're interested in this theme, again, um, in his book, and I don't have this here, but it's on your bibliographic sheet um, where you have a listing of the books that he wrote. If you're interested in reading more about these kinds of experiments in The Footprints of a Dream, the story of the church for the Fellowship of All Peoples, published in 1959, if you see that, you can read about more of that there, okay? Just beautiful experiments in worship. You do get a sense, and this is, um, I think this is in an unpublished essay where <laughs> Thurman actually says that um, unlike sort of the Protestant tradition and most people who you know, espouse the Protestant tradition, the sermon for him was not the most important part. In fact, I think I've read something to that effect um, in this ex excerpt. But the sermon is not the most important part of the, you know, of the, of the, um, the worship service. And, um, and he uses, you know, because he has this sort of this thesis, this underlying argument, um, underlying belief or idea, he sort of uses that to play around with worship quite a bit, okay? Um, later, when we jump to the, um, when we look at our sermon, um, I'll try and point out some things and you will begin to see the play of mysticism. Again, just the, the play, and we'll talk more specifically about mysticism next week, but you'll begin to see, you know, sort of how it begins to play out um, as both sort of bookends to the sermon and also within the sermon, okay, if that makes sense, all right? All right, so let's jump back to the timeline real quick. Um, Howard Divinity School, we're at 1932-1944. In 1935, he receives an honorary doctorate of deg degree from Morehouse. In 1944 to 1953, he um, and his family leave Howard for San Francisco for the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples, which he co-founds with, again, with Dr. Um, uh, Frisk. In 1953 to 1965, he actually leaves San Francisco to go to Boston, and he becomes the dean of the chapel there, professor of spiritual resources and disciplines. Um, he takes a leave of absence in 1962, travel around the world twice in his quote-unquote wider ministry. In 1965, he establishes the Howard Thurman Educational Trust, and then in 1981, he dies. Yes, questions and comments? So the trust, wasn't that created because of that, the inspiration of that man who papered? Wasn't it, isn't that part of the story where somebody, when he was getting ready to go to college, paid for him to have that ticket to the train station. Mm -hmm. Am I reading, is that the right, am I reading that? That might be two different stories, yes. Yeah, some. <coughs> is that him or is that somebody else? I think that that's somebody else, but um, okay. yeah, the stories are right. I mean, you have the stories that, yeah, someone does actually pay for uh, his train ticket yeah, that's to college. I don't think these two are the same. He, that, that's Howard Thurman. I don't think that the part, we don't know who the person was. Oh, no, I'm not talking about that. Oh. I just said it wasn't that his story, but I thought I read too. Yes. That, that was an inspiration for him for, for setting up the trust. Oh, I don't know that. Okay. Somebody okay. Did okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. He was there to, his primary charge was to create what, and was it primarily for young women? 
Well, at Howard, he um, his primary, so he's there uh, to teach and to, uh, he's appointed to the dean of the chapel position, which is the first of, I mean, like maybe two in the country at the time. Yeah. But it wasn't focused in the development and enhancement of young college females. At Spelman it was. Okay. Yeah, Spelman. at Spelman, Thanks. yes. The Morehouse Spelman appointment right after Oberlin in um, what was that? 1929, the 1929 and 1931. Yes. Because yeah. Young female college students weren't an everyday occurrence in that time. Period. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Ex right. That's exactly right. Was his exposure to Quaker mystic uh, Rufus Jones? the foundation that was later enhanced in his pilgrimage friendship to India, particularly to India, where he would have had a, yeah. a dramatic exposure to Hinduism. Um, so this is a significant question. Um, the question, as I'm hearing, I'm going to repeat it back to you to make sure that I'm not just answering what I want to answer, <laughs> but actually answering your question. You're asking me, um, was this initial exposure to mysticism sort of the catalyst for you know, him taking up mysticism throughout the rest of his life, right? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna answer that uh, by saying no, okay? Um, I, and the reason why I'm going to say no, I, I think that it has a significant impact. In fact, in the autobiography, he says that that semester with Rufus Jones, right, changes his life. So I'm not, I don't want to undermine the semester. I think that it gives him, um, and I see you back there, I, give, I think it gives him, you know, sort of the formal um, language for thinking about the mystical mysticism as a category of religion. It gives him that language, okay? Um, I'm going to also say that I don't think that that is his first experience. And the reason why I say that, I think there are two things prior to this semester with Rufus Jones that are fodder um, that present in him an opening uh, for this affinity, a natural affinity. I'm going to go back to that. I think he has a natural affinity. Um, I don't read this, but his grandmother, um, and those of you who know about Thurman, his grandmother was former, uh, formerly enslaved. Okay? Um, his grandmother, towards the end, and she doesn't talk a lot. You know, Thurman says, the, you know, those experiences are not experiences that she shares freely. Um, for good, you know, for good reason. But um, she does talk about one particular aspect of her enslavement, and she talks about, and this again is in the autobiography, and I don't do it justice because it's beautiful. You've you heard his writing. Um, and she talks about there being a preacher, uh, you know, a slave preacher who's allowed to come to their plantation, you know, every so often to preach. And this preacher, you know, basically, um, in only the way that I guess a preacher can do, reminds the group of people, these, these black enslaved folks, they are not just slaves, that they are children of God. Um, she uses the you know, N-word, you know, he says, you're not niggers, you're, you are children, you are the creation of God. So that's one significant story. The other story in terms of his grandmother is, you know, she, she, she enjoys um, hearing Thurman read the Bible to her. But she says to him, you can read anything in the Bible, but you're not going to read from Paul, the Apostle Paul, right? And so she favors the Gospels, stories of Jesus. If you know that, you know, I don't want to assume, you know, raise your hand if you don't know what I'm talking about. But she says, read, you know, I want you to read from the Gospels. 
and um, and so I say those are significant because because a um, again and I don't want to I'm, I'm writing a book so I'm trying not to give it all away <laughs> Try not to give it all away, but I got to tell you, I got to, you know, so I got to tell you these things because, but they, but they do, but they, but they lay the groundwork. I'm just going to leave it there. They lay the groundwork. Um, You'll still buy it. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Um, but, it, but so that sort of lays the groundwork for um, sort of a religion that's beyond the institutional church, if I can say it that way. Um, it is a, um, and, and I, we can talk more about this, um, but it also gives him a particular kind of hermeneutic for reading scripture. You know what that means? Like, it gives him a lens through which to interpret scripture. Okay? Hermeneutic. Hermeneutic. That's the word for the day. Hermeneutic. Okay? All right. So, yes, Rufus Jones gives him that formal, formal, you know, grammar for, you know, thinking about mystical categories, right? Um, but he's already had the experiences, he, and he's also had them in, in nature and written about them quite beautifully. I mean, he writes about these things late in life, but, you know, he's already had these experiences. Um, it's almost, and I'm not trying to project onto Thurman, but it's almost as if he knows God through nature first. You know, again, there's this, um, what's the word I want to use? Maybe navigation with him between the institutional, what he experiences in the institutional church, right? And then what he knows outside of it. Which is true of the mystics. You know, if you know anything about, you know, the medieval mystics, those women that we talked about last week, if you know anything about mysticism, there's always this particular pe peculiar kind of dance between the two. All right, so in the back. Oh, sure? Okay. All right. Okay, yes. Um, so E. Franklin Frazier, right, at Morehouse, he is, you know, an eminent uh, sociologist. Um, he goes on to write and actually influences generations of black religious scholars in particular. Yeah. 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 It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I know a thimbleful. Um, like I said, I was there visiting in 2011, just happened to be there um, when the Academy of Religion hosted, you know, the annual meeting in San Francisco that year. I went. Um, we had a worship service um, there that Friday night, and it still stands. I know that Dorsey Blake, uh, I keep pointing to the screen, it's not up there, but from last week, um, Dorsey Blake has, you know, tried to continue that tradition. I presented a paper that year. Um, and it was so odd. There were people sitting in the room um, who were who had been members and who knew Thurman personally, and who you know talked to me afterwards. And I you know I was kind of moved to tears because I thought, well, here I am trying to make you know multiple of pitiful sense out of the writings, and then they knew him personally. Um, it was phenomenal. So it still stands. It's still active. Um, it still has a very similar mission. Um, but I don't really know much, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, good questions. Any others? All right, so again, you have the, I'm not even gonna go through this, you have the, um, what I'm calling the, well, I don't call it here, but bibliographic sketch. Um, you get a sense, so two things, and I'm gonna move on from this page, but you get a sense of the published works, right, in those, what, 20 books? There's a footnote at the bottom of that page that there are, and I don't even have the numbers right, so this has expanded a bit. Um, 
there, it says, in addition to the materials at Morehouse, the Howard Gottlieb Research Library at Boston University has over 2,000 archival boxes. So, um, and I've, I've written someplace else, like 58,000 pieces of unpub unpublished materials. Excuse me, some of them are now published. Um, Walter Fluker, if it, so if you don't know that name, there's just a handful of folks that write on Thurman. Walter Fluker is one of them. He's at, he teaches at uh, Boston University now. He has recently edited, and I think the fourth volume comes out, should come out this month. This is April, right? So it should come out this month, the fourth volume, but four volumes of um, these previously um, unpublished works. So there are now four volumes. I mean, letters, beautiful letters and you know correspondence between folk, um, early uh, papers that he wrote. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff about Thurman. And I have begun plowing through the books and I'm thinking, I thought I knew Thurman, but then you know there's just so much else here that I didn't know. So there's a lot to know. And you know, and growing Thurman studies. So, you know, those of you who are interested in <laughs> so thinking and writing about him. Yeah. Mm. Is it by the BBC or something like that? It is by the BBC. So YouTube, right? That invention, the oh, recent invention. Um, it's on YouTube. Yeah, look it up. You can find all the Thurman stuff on YouTube. There's a there's quite a lot now. Um, but it's an interview. I think it's part one, part two, with Peter Landrum. On on yeah, it's, it was through the BBC. So yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Ooh. <clears throat> okay. Now, can we do two things at once? Because I just want to make sure we have enough time. Um, I'm going to hand these out, but let's just do it quietly so we can talk. <laughs> um, I want to ask you while these are being passed out. Thank you. I want to ask you because we're going to jump now to the sermon. All right. And. Sermon as a genre, as a particular genre. I want to ask you, what do you know about the sermon as a as a particular um, genre? Um, and you may even, in, in that answer, talk a little bit about um, preaching. You know, so sort of both and. You know, what is the sermon? You know, what have you? What do you know of the sermon? And what do you know? Like, what what is that? What makes the sermon different from other forms of oratory? Okay, what do you know about the sermon? Let's talk, let's, let's talk for a few. In other words, you know, if an alien <laughs> came to visit us and said, oh, well, you know, tell me about, I'm from, I'm from this faraway place, faraway galaxy. Um, I don't know anything about a sermon. What would you, what would you say? Well, what is a sermon? There are, I promise you, there are probably no, probably no wrong answers. <laughs> Short talk designed to teach you something. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Short talk designed to teach you something related to religion in some way. Is that what you said? Good. Yeah. I would say a message. A message. Okay. A message. All right. Short, simple, to the point. It's a message. All right. We hope most of the time it's a message. Yeah, that's the goal. Anyone else? There's an element of it that I think is designed to spur further thinking. Mm. To, to, to inspire deeper thought. Okay. So there is some, some um, you know, we would use this, this is a big Vanderbilt divinity word, but teleological ends. There's, there's some point, right, that the, the, the sermon is trying to get, is trying to move toward. You said what now? Divine? Divine inspiration. Yeah, hopefully there's some divine inspiration. Okay. All right. We're, we're assuming that the alien would, would know what that meant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
That's good. All right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, a connection between the human soul and the thoughts of God. That sounds very Thurmanesque. <laughs> that sounds very Thurmanesque. Just FYI, okay? Very. <laughs> okay, we're not naming any names in this. In this uh, <laughs> this session. All right. That's all very, very, um, all very good. Now, let me say two things. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but also need, no, we don't have very much time left. Um, what I did, again, you have what I've given you in online, okay? You have access to it. Now, what you have access to online um, is a little bit more extensive than what I've given you. I've only given you the sermon today, just because, um, and I'm gonna, what I would like to do is, there was, there was someone that wanted to know if I could re, and I will do this, I'll go back and um, cut the, the shaded parts, what you have in your um, online version that are these, which will make it difficult to print because you know, your printer is gonna, it's gonna use up all your black ink. I'm gonna go back and try and fix that so that next week, um, uh, if you if you want to have the copy with you, print it off at home, okay? Because I'll try and save a few trees and not print those myself. <laughs> Alrighty, okay. So I am going to read a little bit. Um, James Massey, this is James Earl Massey. You may or may not know this name. Um, was really the first to write about Thurman's preaching style. Okay, he writes an article. James Massey is um, is many things. He's written over eight, or had written over eighteen books on preaching and spiritual disciplines. Um, he was a contemporary of um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Thurman um, from the Church of God, and um, he died last year. He was senior pastor of Metropolitan Church of God in, in Detroit, and actually a professor and dean at Anderson University. Taught at Beeson, you know, various places. So. Anyway, he writes this article called Thurman's Preaching, um, Substance and Style. And in it, he reminds that in 1953, Life Magazine, the Life Magazine Board of Judges listed Howard Thurman as one of the 12 greatest preachers in America, 1953. Um, and that was based on a, on, a, on a poll. All right. He writes some very interesting things that I think will be, in, it will be helpful for us as we think about Thurman's preaching, so we think about what it is he's doing and how he structures what he's doing. But these are, these are some of um, James Earl Massey's insights. He says that Howard Thurman creates a spirit of brooding, brooding in his preaching, that the preaching moment is a searching moment. Um, it goes to this point here, this is about the connection, soul and God. Um, he says that Thurman really helps hearers gain confidence in and a better understanding of a life with God. He says that um, that in Thurman, that preaching becomes almost entirely devoted to the meaning of the experience of our common quest and journey. He also notes that he patterned his preaching to help hearers truly worship and thus experience the king of life um, through worship and how it inspires and sustains. Um, he says that, Massey also says that there are patterns in Thurman's sermons, that usually they're, um, that they revolve around a single I insight or idea to which every aspect of the sermon is directed and logically related. Um, he mentions, and Thurman says this, that you're, you're never under obligation to preach a great sermon, but always under obligation to wrestle with a great idea. And I, I really like that quote. You're never under obligation to preach a great sermon, but always under obligation to wrestle with a great idea. Massey also notes that in delivery, preaching was preceded, usually, and then again, you'll see this in, this pub in the published books on um, Thurman sermons, that they're preceded by a meditation and a prayer, or a meditation and prayer, or, or, or a meditation and or a prayer. 
Um, and then, and that could also have been substituted by a different reading. Um, Thurman seeks to remove the strangeness, the difficulty, and unfamil unfamiliarity of religious concepts to make them understood for practical use in the life of faith and daily work. And he also says that um, that Thurman's preaching is not textual; it's a blending of philosophy, existential, <coughs> excuse me, and religious truths. And that Thurman sought to speak to the universals of religious experience. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Basically, one other point to make from Massey, which I found to be compelling, is that, <coughs> excuse me, that in Thurman's preaching, he seeks to create an experience. <coughs> that again, it's not just the sermon or about the sermon, it's about the hearer having ex an experience of God, okay? Excuse me. All right, so let's read and look at what you don't have is the meditation, and I'm not going to read it anyway, but I have time. Um, <clears throat> no, you don't actually have the meditation. You have the end of it. Um, but the beginning of it, if you just want to hear part of it, the beginning of it starts, we bring into, and this would have been the very first thing, so this would have been like in the course, probably the middle of the worship service, you know, after the singing, and whatever, you know, whatever, many other things that would have happened, uh, Thurman would have gotten up, stood behind a lectern or a pulpit, and, um, and started with a meditation. And this is the beginning of the meditation that begins the sermon. We bring into thy quietness, excuse me, we bring into the quietness of thy presence our Father, and notice the language is not, you know, inclusive. This is indicative of times, right? We bring into the quietness of thy presence, our Father, all the particulars of our lives. We would not hold back from thy scrutiny any facet of ourselves. And it goes on. It's beautiful language, right? It's a centering moment, right? Okay, so that's the beginning, and most of the sermons are bracketed by, like, like uh, Massey notes, they're bracketed by a meditation and or a prayer. Okay, and that's the beginning of that meditation. Now, let's jump into the good. We have 15 or so minutes. Um, let's jump into the sermon and actually look at um, what we came here to look at. <laughs> All right, so um, you can see, and we'll read through some of this, but you can see that um, he begins the sermon, and I'll, and I'll sort of read some of it, and those of you all need help with the reading just because whatever this is is kind of taking over my voice so those of you who have big voices and don't mind reading if you would just yes if you would just thank you thank you thank you um if you would and do we have volunteers let me just see a, a few hands so we can see some voices in the room okay all right so excellent um how about this i'll read through um and I'm going to stop and make some comments. I'll read through this first page, and then someone else take up the next column or the next page, and then someone else take up the next page, okay? Hopefully we'll have time to do that. We we'll probably won't, but um, all right. It says, again, this is Thurman. And as you know, these were preached in um, a university chapel. Do you know that? Um, these were preached in, at Boston in Marsh Chapel um, in... 19, I think it's 76 or 78. It's only one. Say that again. What, what's the date on it? 62. 62, okay. All right, 62, 1962. All right, so it begins. I begin this morning a journey which we shall be taking having to do with certain of the fundamental dilemmas in the life of the master. Now, again, this is, this is what we can hear in the background of this is Thurman wrestling, remember what Massey says, wrestling with an idea. In this case, the idea is around dilemma. Okay, it's gonna come up again later. All right, 
again this morning, a journey we should be taking having to do with certain of the fundamental dilemmas in the life of the master. And that's, you know, Jesus, uh, which he refers to um, various names, but this is one of the names. All right, here's some cultural materials that are, that are at play, that are often at play in, in Thurman, cultural materials, right? Um, as a background for our consideration today, I want to read two things, one by Oscar Wilde and the other by the British poet Clive Sampson. And I quote, there is still something to me almost incredible in the idea of a young Galilean peasant imagining that he could bear on his shoulders the burden of the entire world, all that had already been done and suffered, and all that was yet to be done and suffered. The sins of Nero, the Caesar of Borgia, of Alexander the Sixth, and of him who was emperor of Rome and priest of the sun. The sufferings of those whose names are legion and whose dwelling is among the tombs, oppressed nationalities, factory children, thieves, people in prison, outcasts, those who are dumb under oppression and whose silence is only heard of God. And not merely imagining this, but actually achieving it so that at the present moment, all who come in contact with his personality, even though they may neither bow to his altar or kneel before his priest, in some way find that the ugliness of their sin is taken away and the beauty of their sorrow revealed to them. In this from the British poet, the brothers address Jesus. Going from Nazareth, where? To the Jordan Valley, leaving your home and your trade, your own kinsfolk, for what? For an unwashed preacher, a ranting hermit, who sacrificed family and wealth in a seat in the priesthood for locusts and prophecies? Why? You are mad, insane, selling your life for a whim, a religious frenzy? Mad. Yes, mad. You share his faith and his filth? Outcast like him, rejected by brother and friend, a life of rebellion, hunger, and a shameful death. If the, thoughts, if the thought of that leaves you unmoved, then remember us, your brothers and sisters, the mother who gave you birth. See her there standing in tears, forsaken, bewildered, left by her firstborn, you, the, the head of the household. Think of her neighbor's looks, the humiliation, her fears, and her griefs. What? What do you say? Whoever obeys the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, my mother. By the God of Israel, would you preach at us? Your ministry start at home? Better recall, if you can, your father in Nazareth, your pledge to him, your promise of filial care. You shall honor your father and mother. Remember that when, your mouth, when you mouth your text. Remember that and carry forever the shame of your father's children. Okay, there is the interplay of text there. So there's sort of a back and forth between um, some text that would have been familiar to Jesus, okay? We're gonna have to move from there, but um, here I'm gonna outline in this next paragraph, oh, was I supposed to stop there? <laughs> All right, so if the next person would take it, um, but let me just say that the next paragraph again is um, the idea, thank you, of dilemma, right? This is what Thurman is wrestling with in this particular sermon, dilemma. Okay, so would you take up the next? Okay. It is very important to lay a general foundation for our thinking together about certain of the dilemmas of Jesus. A dilemma is the kind of problem that a man faces when uh, live options, alternatives are presented to him. Any one of which is not quite a satisfying solution to the problem that confronts him. Very often when we are faced with our dilemmas, we are not as fortunate as is indicated by a sign I saw 30 years ago at a town in Texas called Big Sandy. My train coach stopped across the highway. I looked out of the window and saw a huge sign. It must have been 20 feet high and about 20 feet square. It read, 
five highways meet here, four chances to go wrong. That's us. <laughs> but we aren't as fortunate as that when we face our dilemmas. Jesus of Nazareth had what seems to me to have been a fundamental and searching, almost devastating experience of God. The, this experience was so from and so fundamental to the very grounds of his being that he had to deal with the implications of this experience whenever he raised any question about the meaning and function of his own life. When he heard that John the Baptist was preaching at the Jordan River, it must have been quite a problem for him. <coughs> shall I go and hear him, or shall I ignore him? If my personal and private and intimate religious experience, my experience of God is valid, if it is authentic, if it is dependable, then I do not need any other than self-reference. And besides, John is saying to everybody, repent of your sins and receive the kingdom of God. What does this say to me if I go down there and present myself for baptism? If I accept baptism at his hands, then doesn't this give to us utterance and his movements the sanction of my heart and my mind? As if what he is saying and what he is doing represent the fulfillment of the meaning of that which I, myself, have experienced under God. <laughs> this is always the dilemma. <laughs> Shall I wait until the most perfect thing comes along and identify myself with that? Or shall I accept something that doesn't quite say all that I think can be said, but is the best that is being said at this particular time? We feel this way sometimes about the church, don't we? We forget that the church is made up of the halt and the lame and the blind, the sinners, the prejudiced, those whose hearts are bitter, and those whose hearts are sweet. It is made up of the people who make up the world. I knew a man in Oberlin when I was the minister there who would not join my church or any church because he said that he did not want to lose his soul. <laughs> he said that as long as he stayed out of the church, he could be greatly ex exercised about trying to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. But if he joined the church, he would become confused. Mm -hmm. There are many people who feel that way. Well, Jesus may have felt that way about John. But at any rate, he presented him for baptism. Okay, let's stop right there. Okay, um, and then we'll take up with the next person. But before we do, um, so here you, you see uh, um, several things. So again, I mentioned you know, that this is an example of you know, Thurman wrestling with the great idea, that idea being what? Dilemma, right? Um, now, this really speaks to several things, but it speaks to um, the way in which, and you'll see this again and again, the way in which Thurman will take these big ideas and, and, and make them very practical, right? Um, he has a way of opening up a text. Um, I'm going to use the word pragmatic, right? Where um, a text can sort of transcend difference, right? That a text, in this case, this is a very particular text about a very particular moment in the life of Jesus. And we have yet to even hear what the text is, right? We don't even know, right? We do, we do know, if we're familiar with the tradition, with, the, with Christian tradition, we'll know that this text has something to do with what happens to Jesus after he's baptized by John, and this is in all four of the Gospels, I think, bat bat baptized by John in the Jordan. He's led out, um, there's the scripture reference says that he is led out into the wilderness. He spends 40 days and 40 nights. But again, you know, we don't have a sense of the scripture yet. Thurman, and it's not just that I haven't photocopied it, it's not there, okay? It's just not there. So it could be that that's on purpose because again, Thurman 
will time and time again uh, try and get the most um, out of an idea, out of um, something that's more parochial and more uh, common to a particular tradition. We'll try to get the, the, you know, the most, what they say, the bang for your buck. Um, because there's something about Thurman that suggests that um, while religion has its particularities, there's also something that's very core um, to the human con condition to which and for which religion speaks. Okay? And in this particular sermon, that core or that core idea is a dilemma. We've all, in other words, he's building. He's trying to say, listen, you know, regardless of religious background, affiliation, and the like, everybody in the room has experienced dilemma. What it means to be caught in a real dilemma, you know, not a made up one, uh, but in a real dilemma, okay? So very pragmatic, very practical kind of wrestling with, with an idea. Okay, would, yes, please. Would you finish that page? When Jesus was baptized with John, a very extraordinary thing happened to him. It seemed to him that the heavens opened and that the living spirit of the living God descended upon him like a dove. And in the midst of this experience, he heard a voice. And the voice said, you are my son, in whom I am well pleased. And then he laughed, shaken to the core. I must find some place of complete and utter isolation, a chance to sense the bearings of this tremendous experience, lest I find myself betraying it or betrayed by it. He went into the wasteland to sit it out, to think, to weigh, and to wait. There is a congregational church in Chicago, about 10 blocks from the loop, where there is an amazing painting of the temptations of Jesus. Jesus is seated on a rock overlooking a valley. That much is the traditional image which artists portray. He's looking straight ahead. As you stand watching the figure, your eyes get adjusted to the light on it. And this is what you see. Dozens of fingers clutching at his mind. What shall I do with my life if I'm going to be true to the tremendous experience of God which I have had? What can I live so that my life will not deny the glory which I saw and felt? Or was the glory which I saw and felt completely otherworldly and beyond anything that human experience can seek to implement? Is it something that is separate and is not to be a part of the warp and woof, the stuff of human experience? Was I invaded by something that does not belong to the nature and the character of the normal working paper of human life? That is the question. You go yeah, go ahead. And, uh, yeah, and, th mm -hmm. and then, after a long time thinking, proing and conning, <laughs> ifing, but on the other handing, <laughs> his eyes fell on a stone at his feet. Mm -hmm. And the stone looked just like one of the cakes that his mother used to make. At once he became aware of something which had been on the per periphery of his mind for a long time but he hadn't gotten around to it. It hadn't moved to the center of his consciousness. He was hungry, and then the struggle was on. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. What time do we have? It's 12.15, isn't it? Yes. A few more minutes? Okay. Shall we go on? Yeah. Okay, we'll read fast. Who, who was our other volunteer? Who was our other, please. In the moment, coming up out of the water of the river of Jordan, when the heavens opened and he could scarcely discern between that which he, between that which was you and that which was the light, the Shekinah of your father, the, this moment was the moment of all of your life. So, 
Why not reduce that loan to the manageable units of confirmation by putting it to work to administer to the needs which must be met if you are to be released to be in the world which you could be? Turn the stone to bread. Mm. Thus argued the tempter. For a long time, all he could think of were those few words, these few words, man. Man must not live by bread. There is something wrong with that. Man has to have bread. Man must not live, must not live by bread. Man must not live by bread, bread, by bread. But men do live by bread. And if a man is hungry, he can't get through to his spirit unless, unless his hunger has been collected as the avenue through which he seeks the highway of God. But if hunger is another kind, you can't get through to him until you meet the hunger. Man does live by bread, but man does, but man, but bread. If I have all bread I need and something else doesn't happen, I am still poor. There is something wrong with this, man. Man does not live by bread alone. Mm. That must have been day between the first part of the sentence and the last word. Mm. I wonder how many weary hours he said it over and over again. Man must not live by bread. Not being able to get beyond it until at last, there must have leaped into his mind like a flash of blinding light one word, alone. Ah, that is the practical world, even for one who has seen visions and feels that there is incumbent upon him some peculiar ministry to his people or to other people. Nevertheless, even for him, it is a practical world. Man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there, folks. You have the rest of it. Finish it. Um, I'll, next week, we'll be looking at um, another sermon from this series. This is a series, so it gets even better, if it can be, right? Um, and we'll, we'll continue to talk, so don't feel, you know, we're not rushed. We are rushed today, but <laughs> we'll keep playing with, you know, what is it that, th that Thurman is doing and why, and how is he doing it through the genre of sermon, okay? So see you next week. All right. Thank you.